Rikot structure is a giant formation in the Sahara that looks exactly like a giant bullseye. It's so wide that you can see it from space. Even the CIA got interested in it. In 1965, they planned a flyover looking for geomagnetic anomalies. The findings are still classified. Perhaps the theories are true. And this place is truly the lost city of Atlantis. Now, Atlantis supposedly sank beneath the waves. But recent discoveries are pointing us in a different direction. This is an ancient story that goes far back in time, and Plato was the first to mention it. The place had loads of greenery and a curious structure. Three concentric circles of land surrounding two circles of water. Two key quotes from Plato's writing suggest that Atlantis might not have been a typical island in the middle of the ocean. Plus, Atlantis had a major influence from Africa and Europe, challenging the idea of it being in the Atlantic. It turns out that the Eye of the Sahara and Atlantis look alike. When astronauts saw the Eye of Sahara from above, they initially suspected a meteorite impact crater. But the rings of the structure matched the layout described of Atlantis. More importantly, the Sahara wasn't always a desert. It turned from a tropical region into a desert around 11,000 years ago. Researchers found evidence of a massive river called the Tamarasset that could have sustained a community. This river flowed toward the Rikat structure, aligning with Plato's description. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran through the Sahara 50 to 100 million years ago. The sea allegedly destroyed Atlantis around 11,500 years ago, likely due to a rapid rise in sea level caused by the end of the Ice Age. NASA's worldview imagery shows patterns consistent with this theory. Those concentric rings might be a key to unlocking the secrets of our planet's evolution over millions of years. They're shaped by erosion on resilient rock layers, creating a spooky pattern of ridges and troughs. The central peak stands proud at 1,300 feet. The central part has undergone a significant erosion makeover, revealing a circular structure with a raised peak. Unlike impact craters, the eye of the Sahara flaunts a striking balance and symmetry. Some say it results from rock uplift, sculpted by wind and water. Others think it's an ancient anticline, eroded to reveal its concentric glory. Then there's a salt diapir theory, suggesting that salt's buoyancy sculpted this beauty. Dating techniques have proved that it formed 541 to 252 million years ago, give or take a million or two. Ancient tools are scattered around the outer rings of the structure near riverbeds. Some older stone tools have also been spotted in the same areas. And still, even though some spear points from the Neolithic period have been found, there aren't many signs that people were living there back then. The area seems to have been used for short-term activities like hunting and making tools. There are other unearthly mysteries that haunt our world. One such enigma is in Norway the ominous Hestalen light phenomenon, also known as the Valley of Lights, leaves scientists confused. This valley is 10 miles wide. It's quite isolated, but a peculiar blue box sits high on the hillside, equipped with cameras scanning the valley. The unsettling saga began in the 1980s, when the night sky over Hestalen erupted with burning fireballs, a recurring spectacle that sent shivers down the spines of those who witnessed it. This wasn't a fleeting occurrence. Rather, it became a regular thing. Terrified locals reported encounters with these unexplained luminous phenomena, some of which happened near their homes. Unease spread like wildfire. At its peak, there were about 20 sightings every week. The phenomenon made its way into newspapers, magazines, and media worldwide. Soon, people flocked to the valley, hoping to see the lights themselves. In 1984, experts joined the fray, armed with sophisticated instruments like magnetometers, radiometers, and other ometers. What they encountered was mind-bending, lights that defied explanation. Some moved at a leisurely pace, while others raced through the sky at an astonishing 19,000 miles per hour. People tried to explain these lights. Airplanes, distant reflections, ball lightning, satellites, planets, meteors. But the speed and how these lights danced ruled out all those theories. We're slowly approaching another mysterious place. This is the greatest subglacial lake among Antarctica's 675 known lakes. It can easily hide unknown life forms. This lake is beneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. Dive about 2.5 miles under the ice 
and there you'll see Lake Vashtok, located at 1,600 feet below sea level. This lake is 155 miles long and 31 miles wide at its broadest point. With an average depth of 1,400 feet, it's also the world's sixth largest by volume. It's like an underwater city with lofty pillars and deep basins. The secret lake was discovered in 1993, yet it had been waiting to be found down there for over 2,000 years, collecting ancient secrets. In 2012, scientists drilled through the ice, creating the longest ice core ever. They pierced the ice all the way to the lake surface. The year 2013 brought an unexpected twist when the tranquil waters erupted during the extraction of an ice core, mixing with drilling fluids. Then they got a pristine water sample in 2015. Some believe there might be previously unknown life forms down there, since it's a fossil water reserve that's been untouched for millions of years. They could be a lot like those speculated ice-covered oceans on moons like Europa and Enceladus. It all started with a theory in the 19th century, suggesting fresh water lurking under Antarctic ice sheets. Then, in 1955, seismic soundings hinted at a subglacial lake. And by the 90s, satellite data confirmed Lake Vashtok's existence. Now, Lake Vashtok isn't alone. In 2005, they found an island in the middle of the lake. Then, two smaller lakes joined the party. They suspect that a secret network of subglacial rivers might link these lakes. Now, very far away from Antarctica, in Venezuela, Catatumbo lightning presents a sinister light show at the junction of the Catatumbo River and Lake Maracaibo. This unsettling lightning phenomenon happens at about 140 to 160 nights a year, going on for 10 hours a day, and can flash up to 280 times in a single hour. The frequency of this lightning show changes with the seasons and from year to year. There was a break between January to March in 2010, causing a bit of worry that it might vanish forever. As the sun sets, winds from the east start picking up speed. The strong wind is called a nocturnal low-level jet, like what you see in the Great Plains of North America. These winds bring moisture, mostly from the Caribbean and the lake itself. This humid air hits high mountain ridges, causing thunderstorms to form over the mountains. Thanks to the ongoing wind situation, more thunderstorms appear as the night goes on. This pattern repeats itself, and is why this area has the highest annual lightning rate globally. The next place scientists cannot explain is in China. That is the Longyu Caves. They have lofty slanted roofs and sturdy pillars. This spot remained hidden for centuries. These human-made caverns, built around 2,000 years ago, decided to reveal themselves only in the 90s. Local farmers drained some ponds and unveiled five massive caverns. Further digging exposed an additional 19 smaller caves. They range from 60 to 110 feet in width and 26 to 50 feet in height. Archaeologists found historical relics from the reign of Emperor Zhuan of Han dating back to over 2,000 years ago. Now, how did these caves survive for more than two millennia without falling apart? No ancient records explain the way they were crafted either. The walls show chisel marks, hinting at some layer-by-layer -layer chiseling action, but the exact construction process is still a head-scratcher. Are you a pro swimmer? Brave enough to take a dip in any ocean or sea? Bad news. There are some places you should avoid no matter how well you swim or dive. Some of these places have dangerous underwater rocks, strong currents and tides. Others are famous for legends about monsters and mysterious creatures. So let's dive into this aquatic horror show. Have you ever heard the word the strid? It's a variation of the word the stride that is used in Yorkshire. And it refers to a narrow section of the river wharf that's so small you could jump over it. But don't be fooled by its size, it's one of the most dangerous spots around. Even taking a step into the water can have dire consequences. The river wharf has a forceful current, and since the strid is so narrow, it's even stronger in that area. The intense water flow has eroded the limestone around the strid, which created hollow spaces much deeper than the rest of the riverbed. Here's the secret. The current has also weakened the banks of the strid from below. So, the ground you're standing on, admiring the rapid flow, is probably just a fragile ledge hanging over treacherous waters. 
There's no record of anyone who found themselves in the water of the Strid and found their way out of it. And the worst part? You wouldn't even guess that this innocent-looking stream could be such a danger. So, my advice to you, my friend, is to stick to a safer body of water for your aquatic adventures. If you're looking for a weekend getaway in California, Horseshoe Lake is the spot for you. It's got everything. Sandy beaches, hiking trails, and picnic areas, but wait, there's more to it than meets the eye. This lake has a dark side, namely around 100 acres of dead trees that surround it. And it's not just the trees that have been claimed by this lake. The earthquakes that hit in 1989 and 1990 unleashed carbon dioxide from under the hot magma. The gas seeped out into the air, damaging all the life around the lake. Even now, Horseshoe Lake is just as dangerous as it was 30 years ago. What makes it so scary is that the levels of this toxic gas change randomly. Warning signs that are posted everywhere certainly could give a horror film touch to a fun hike in the woods. In Kauai, Hawaii, there's a group of stunning waterfalls that used to be a popular destination for tourists. Kipu Falls, as they're called, were once the go-to spot for swimming and diving. To get to them, you had to take a long walk along a dirt path until you finally arrived at a breathtaking view of a 20-foot waterfall pouring into a crystal-clear pool below. But since 2011, this area has been off-limits to the public. Why, you ask? Well, there have been a lot of accidents at Kipu Falls. Obviously, jumping off the top of the waterfall would be an obvious reason for that. But in addition, there were much more mysterious cases. Witnesses tell tales of swimmers peacefully enjoying the pool at the bottom of the falls, only to be suddenly dragged under the surface. No definite explanation was found to these accidents. The locals believe that the water spirit Mo'o is to blame because it doesn't appreciate being disturbed by loud tourists. There's also a theory of a powerful whirlpool at the bottom of the pool. In any case, guide publishers do not mention Kipu Falls anymore, and trespassing is severely punished. The Samizan Hole, located in the Gulf of Thailand, is the ultimate spot for thrill-seeking divers, but it's also the most dangerous one. With a drop of 280 feet, it's the deepest diving site in the region. But its depth is not the only reason it is considered a place to avoid. The area is a major shipping zone for giant oil tankers. The strong currents around the hole make diving even more treacherous. And if that's not enough, the Samisan Hole is also home to deadly barracudas that could easily attack unsuspecting divers. The water is so murky that visibility is nearly zero, making it challenging to spot these aggressive sea creatures. All in all, the Samisan Hole is a breathtaking but extremely hazardous spot that should only be explored by experienced divers with nerves of steel. Let me tell you about New Smyrna Beach, the shark attack capital of the world. If you're looking for a relaxing vacation spot in Volusia County, Florida, you may want to reconsider this beach. The waters around New Smyrna Beach are teeming with fish, which attracts a lot of sharks. In fact, there have been so many shark attacks reported in this area that it's earned the title of the shark attack capital of the world. Even scientists have warned that if you go for a swim there, you're bound to get up close and personal with at least one of these creatures. We are talking about a distance of 10 feet, and in many cases, you wouldn't even notice it. To make matters worse, the bull shark, one of the most dangerous and aggressive types of sharks, has been spotted in these waters. Once again, Kauai is on our list. The beach on Nepali coast called Hanakapiai Beach might look like heaven on earth, but don't be fooled. To get there, you have to trek through a super steep, rocky two-mile trail. There are no lifeguards on this remote beach, so even if you decide to take a dip in the water, you're on your own. The biggest threat to your safety is the incredibly strong rip currents. They are almost always present because there are no reefs to shield the shore. And if someone gets caught in one, there's no safe place to swim to for miles. The nearest safe beach is six miles away. Trust me, this beach doesn't have the best track record in terms of safety. So it's highly advised that you stay out of the water if you end up at this beach. 
let me tell you about a place that looks like it's straight out of a horror movie. We're talking about Berkeley Pit, which is an artificial lake situated in Butte, Montana. The first thing you'll notice about this place is that it has an eerie blood-red color that can only be described as unsettling. You might be tempted to take a dip, but that would be a grave mistake. Don't even touch it. The water is extremely dangerous due to the heavy metals present in it, such as cadmium, arsenic, zinc, lead, and copper. They come from the rocks that surround the lake and make the water super acidic. In fact, this place used to be an open pit copper mine, hence its color. So if you want my advice, avoid this place like the plague. There are three lakes in Africa that maybe are the most dangerous places of all that I have mentioned so far. They're all located in Africa. Lake Monoon and Lake Nyos in Cameroon and Lake Kivu in Rwanda are all like ticking timers ready to go off. They were formed over underground pools of molten rock. And sometimes this molten rock releases toxic gases like methane and carbon dioxide right into the water. When this happens, the gases can build up until they suddenly burst out of the water, creating massive waves that can wipe out everything in their path. This type of outburst is called a limnic eruption, and it can release a cloud of poisonous gas that can be harmful to everything in the vicinity. The most terrifying part? These explosions can happen at any moment with no warning. So if you ever find yourself near one of these lakes, you'd better be on high alert because you never know when the next accident might happen. Maybe you know other places you wouldn't recommend for a fun swim? Share your anti-recommendations in the comments below. The ground shakes beneath you. The pictures rattle on the walls. You hear a rumble off in the distance. Then, boom, a deafening explosion. The shockwave blasts through the windows and sets off car alarms. You duck under the dining table for cover, but then you remember you live not far from a supervolcano in the middle of a tropical jungle. So staying in one place isn't a good idea. The shaking finally halts. You take this chance to peek outside and see a giant cloud of smoke covering the sky. It's lunchtime, but you wouldn't know it. The sun is completely veiled and darkness falls. The power's out in the whole city. In this darkness, you see red molten lava shooting from the sky and spilling on the rim. You run outside along with dozens of your neighbors. Your priority right now? Find safe shelter and fast. You think about taking the car, but with mm. everyone running on the road, that's a no-go. So you run on foot where the crowd is going. Super volcanoes are in a league of their own when it comes to natural disasters. Surprisingly, it's not all about size or height. A volcano is dubbed super if it erupts more than 240 cubic miles of magma. That's more than enough to overfill Lake Erie. It must also have a history of erupting and a magnitude of 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. The largest active volcano on Earth is Hawaii's Mauna Loa. It's so big, it would cover the entire state of Rhode Island plus some. And next time you see a commercial plane flying high in the sky, remember that 30,000-some-foot altitude is about as tall as Mauna Loa is from base to summit. It's technically taller than Everest when you measure it like that, yet it's not considered a supervolcano. So you're running along the dark road not knowing and barely seeing where to go. Then, all of a sudden, a massive flaming boulder smashes through the bridge in front of you. You and everyone else are now stranded on the side of the volcano as it's getting more chaotic each second. Most of the crowd disperses, finding their own ways to safety. You remember there's a way to the other side not many people know about. But you'll have to cross a raging river through the dense jungle. You calm what's left of the crowd, and everyone follows you to your secret getaway. You finally get out of the city limits and head into the jungle. With the sky already dark, the tall trees and thick leaves make it almost pitch black. Everyone gets out their phone flashlights to navigate through the dark path. You all need to stick together and make sure nobody gets lost. Suddenly, fiery rocks strike the trees not far from you. Everyone jolts and tries to rush ahead. But nowhere is safe when it's raining scalding fire all around. You and your group have to pick up the pace or else. 
Imagine a typical avalanche or mudslide. Very dangerous situations on their own. Now, imagine an avalanche of lava rocks and lava sliding down a mountain instead of mud. That's what's making its way towards you right now. More and more people catch up with your group and bring news that the entire neighborhood is submerged in lava. It's traveling quicker than you thought. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can move slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous problem. If you didn't have protection, the gases spewing from the eruption would fill your lungs, and those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Your eyes and throat would be itchy. You'd get a headache, dizziness, increased heart rate, difficulty breathing. The worst would be passing out from the lack of oxygen. Luckily, everyone managed to grab their gas masks before leaving their homes. You're now entering the treacherous terrain of the jungle and the danger zone. Everyone's phone batteries are giving out one by one, so your vision is even more limited. The terrain is tougher, and you can't hear any sounds from the river. At this point, you're not even sure if you're going the right way. But your instincts tell you the deeper you go, the safer you'll be. The path is muddy, and the vines are hindering everyone's movements. That's when you hear something big running through the jungle. It's coming up on you fast. You can't see a thing until it's right up on you. A bear! And there goes a rhino! Wild cats, domestic cats, dogs, different creatures of all sizes and species. They all come running through the jungle right past you. You and your fellow humans aren't the only ones fleeing from the eruption. The rumbling is still going on. Before you know it, a shower of fire rocks strikes right behind you and ignites parts of the jungle. There's no going back. Everyone picks up and runs for it. You hear thunder in the distance. A flash of lightning lights up the dark sky. You think, finally, some rain to wash away this fiery nightmare. But that's not a regular storm brewing. These giant smoke clouds can mimic a thunderstorm under similar conditions. Your luck finally pays off. You hear the river straight ahead. You reach the bank and have to hop on some stones to get to the other side. You almost slip when someone from the group catches you just in time. Whew, that was too close. Not far down the river is a large waterfall leading straight to a shallow lake with sharp rocks at the bottom. The ash from the lava falls like snow, covering most of the trees and landing on the river. Ash is one of the most dangerous things about volcanic eruptions. You're soaked to the bone, but it's a lot better than ash and smoke. And then the rest of the group follow. The next thing you know, the river starts steaming as lava meets the bank and runs into the water. You try your best to speed things up. The lava can heat this water up to dangerous levels, and there are still people slowly crossing the river on the slippery rocks. Luckily, you manage to get everyone across. Well, almost everyone. You turn around and see someone's leg got caught between two rocks. The lava continues to pour into the river. You can feel the heat of the steam. You rush back to this person and try to pull them out. Their leg won't bud. Someone else from the group comes to help, and you're finally able to pull them out in the nick of time. You and everyone else, now exhausted from your trek, keep going as far as possible. That's when you see the main road that connects you to the broken bridge. There are others on the road that got out safely, and even some cars filling up with survivors and heading fast out of the area. The volcano is still spewing lava, and the entire city is flooded with it. What was once your town now looks like a giant burning lake. Planes and helicopters can't fly because of the smoke and ash, so don't count on an air rescue. You're still at risk even though you're on safer ground, so it's still too early to celebrate. Everyone continues to move away from the city. The further, the better. The ground continues to shake, but this time it's even more intense than before. Supervolcanoes are powerful enough to cause many earthquakes. But it's a good thing you're out in the open, far from the buildings and debris in the city. Now, back to reality. Rest assured that a volcanic eruption of this intensity won't happen for a very long time, as in millions of years. Besides, thanks to warning systems and humanity's preparation for such an event, 
it's extremely rare for even a regular volcano to do as much damage as it could. So don't scratch Yellowstone off your travel list just yet. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system. But the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTown. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit. 
because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to 15%. Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame and electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. 
swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly 1,000 feet beneath the surface, with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Luscantire Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day, making it way more dramatic and monochrome. The Georgia Guide Stones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 and was built the last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land, including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind, too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes Al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, unusually cold weather in the northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called the Sueda salsa dwells in the salt water. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the stone of Davasco in Argentina. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. 
1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So, even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Socotra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the Dragon Tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight-burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world. The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity a human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it! Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. The ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. You've probably heard about the mysterious sea state of Atlantis. It was a high-tech utopia where people lived happily. But then something happened, and Atlantis disappeared from the face of the Earth. Many people believe that this city lies at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. But what if we've been looking in the wrong place all this time? What if it's somewhere different from where they're trying to find it? What if all this time Atlantis was in the middle of the Sahara Desert? Well, this unexpected theory has some evidence, but to study this version, you first need to understand what Atlantis was and how we got to know about it. The very first mention of the mysterious city was in 360 BCE. Ancient philosopher Plato wrote about Atlantis, his work, Dialogues, described Atlantis as a rich land with advanced technologies. Its inhabitants were powerful, intelligent, and beautiful, like superhumans. He described in detail the structure of the city, and this was the main reason why many people believed in the existence of Atlantis. According to his records, the Atlanteans built this place in several concentric circles of black and red stone. Then, they covered these circles with brass, tin, and precious metals. In the city, there were water channels on which ships sailed. The Atlanteans were sailors, so they built a passage from their city to the open sea. 
On the internet, you can find many drawings of Atlantis, created based on Plato's descriptions. Take a look at these drawings and an actual photo of the Eye of the Sahara. This place in the Sahara has a shape of several concentric circles. It looks as if a destroyed city left a trace on the sand. Many people have written online that the lost city was located there, but no one could prove it. Once upon a time, the Sahara was filled with rivers and lakes. In prehistoric times, there was only water there. So far, everything matches. The Eye of the Sahara was first discovered in the 1930s. This place was considered a crater from a fallen meteorite. But in the middle of the 20th century, scientists conducted a soil analysis and refuted the version with a fallen space rock. In the end, everyone agreed that this was a dome of molten rocks under which magma was raging. For millions of years, wind and water had been destroying the formed landscape and eventually made it look like perfect circles. But what if the Atlanteans once came to this place and used natural circles to build a city? In this case, we would have many traces and artifacts from this developed civilization. And yes, archaeologists did find some arrowheads, spears, oars, and other things there. But this has nothing to do with Atlantis. In the Eye of the Sahara, a multitude of Ashulian artifacts lies. It was an ancient tribe that frequented this place. For the first time, Ashulian tools appeared more than one and a half million years ago. Some of the items found there may be 130,000 years old. And according to the records, Atlantis existed about 12,000 years ago. Archaeologists found no artificial structures in this place. There was also no debris or traces of a large city. People would have found some stuff if a big city with advanced technologies had existed here. The main supporter of this idea was one YouTube channel. It collected a million views and attracted the attention of many historians and anthropologists. The theory that the Eye of the Sahara is Atlantis was quickly refuted. People found too many discrepancies between this place and the description of Atlantis. The author tried to catch the viewer's attention by presenting external similarities between the natural landscape and the fictional ancient city. Another popular theory claims that Atlantis was a real continent located off the Bahamas. But then, this city was swallowed up by the Bermuda Triangle. According to this legend, the city ruins still lie at the bottom of the triangle. But there's no confirmation of this theory either. Writer Charles Berlitz invented it. Adherents of this theory claim that the walls and streets in the western part of the Bahamas might be the ruins of Atlantis. But scientists disagree. They have proven that these walls are natural formations of coastal rocks. There are also rumors that the story of Atlantis was inspired by an actual historical catastrophe, the Black Sea Flood. This is the Bosporus, a strait in Turkey connecting the Black Sea and the Sea of Marmara. Around 5,600 BCE, the Black Sea was twice as small as it is now and had many cities on its shores. Unfortunately, a huge flood destroyed this flourishing civilization. Within a year, cities descended underwater, and surviving inhabitants moved to foreign lands and spread stories about the flood. Maybe these stories inspired Plato to come up with Atlantis. In the 1950s, people came up with another version. Atlantis was the continent that is now Antarctica. Tens of thousands of years ago, a warm continent with a developed city shifted to the northern part of our planet because of the movement of Earth's crust. The Atlanteans couldn't adapt to the cold conditions and Atlantis was covered with a thick layer of ice. This theory was refuted when scientists began studying the tectonic plate's nature. It turned out that Earth's crust couldn't have moved such a huge continent as Antarctica. The tectonic plates don't behave this way at all. But the main question is, was Atlantis real? No one had described it before Plato. Perhaps the philosopher came up with it. Maybe he did this to emphasize the correctness of his views on life and to identify his philosophical theories. In his works, he wrote a lot about divine and human nature and how people can destroy this nature. 
he spoke of decaying ideal societies because of immoral behavior and vices. The Atlanteans were once moral, spiritual people who created a utopia, but then they became greedy and mean. They destroyed their inner nature, and for this, they had to witness the destruction of their city. One night, fires and earthquakes hit Atlantis and plunged the city into the sea. The higher powers punished people for their immoral behavior, and Plato also wanted everyone to be afraid of moral decay. But judging by the descriptions of the earthquakes and fire, it may seem that Atlantis was destroyed by a volcanic eruption, as it was with the ancient Roman city of Pompeii. And such destructions have happened pretty often throughout history. Natural disasters ruined many developed cities. One of the most famous cases occurred in 1100 BCE in the Mediterranean Sea when a volcanic eruption destroyed the highly developed Minoan society. The Minoan society existed for about 2,000 years. These people mostly lived on the islands of Crete and Santorini, located north of Crete. The Minoans had beautiful houses, a sewage system, and a developed economy. They were engaged in agriculture, grew fruits and vegetables, painted frescoes, and made jewelry. They were the first people to found the Thalassocracy, an empire based on the sea. They lived off of fishing, piracy, and maritime trade. At the time, they performed cruel rituals, and their way of life was far from moral. They were used to earthquakes on the island of Santorini, so they reinforced the walls of the city with wooden beams, but they didn't know what a volcanic eruption was. And when the sulfur smell appeared in the air, they didn't suspect the impending catastrophe. When the volcano spilled out tons of lava and ash, all the residents of Santorini abandoned their homes and tried to escape, but they couldn't. The eruption and earthquake triggered a tsunami. A large wave flooded the coastal part of the island of Crete. This hit the economy of the Minoans hard and destroyed their port harbor. Then, foreigners attacked Crete and finally destroyed the developed civilization. Some historians think that Plato could have referred to the Minoan Empire when describing Atlantis. Using their example, he showed how immoral actions could destroy people.